are many announcements and content, and I have a few just to um, draw your attention to. Inside your bulletin this morning, the Lord has been issued the order for it. If you would like to order some of your information spread for Christmas giving, these will be ready for you to pick up December the 11th. And along with all time favorites, they have added a cheddar pounding bread. Um, the order forms, as I said, are in your bulletin. And the money to pay for it through your order form, or you may give it to me in the phone. We ask for you to please pray for yourself and for safe travels home from Bethlehem for our middle school students as they are traveling home this morning. Announcements for mission and outreach. On November the 28th, we will be taking meal down to the Citadel for the students who participate in the Journey Camp Ministry. We'll serve the food, eat with the students, and participate in their worship and Bible study. If you would like to go, please be in church at 530 and have on Sunday, November the 28th. We'll park them down um, for this kind of fellowship with the students. Thank you for your donations for each week for the Christmas food boxes for our children and families. We will be serving, uh, putting together approximately 25 boxes. So all of your donations are most helpful. A reminder that AAN receives the greatest Halloween candy ever. And if you still have any leftover Halloween candy that you would like to get rid of, please pray that there are lots of fellowship offers. Next Sunday, we will be taking up the offering for Philip Lord. And this time, Mary Penny is going to do our mother permission. Um, Carolyn asked me to do a moment, a limited edition of the format, which meant I had to have a match for the format. Um, I would like to insult you in some ways. I'm a fair share of my father's great seven months. And um, four months established 147 years ago by the most former man. But that's what it was me. The children were sorted out and moved in after I was born. But our came to a conception that has thrived for hundreds of years that we get to have a box in the box to make this community and have a box and to not only represent the village, the village, but they have also um, prepared in foster care, they um, do in home counseling, they do transitional care for the um, schools. I believe 18 years old or three years old, we have lots of schools. Um, they have literacy programs, pretty much the things that we need right at that. So this is my favorite of the special offerings we do. Presbyterian Church is good at taking care of our babies, our children, our elders, those that need help the most. And um, the goal of the offer is really to um, be here at first. Of the three states, we have quite a budget of about five point five million dollars, and they depend upon our donation with help. So, you know, if you can find it in your heart to donate, the donation will be paid on the next Sunday, on the twenty. Thank you so much.
before we stand to um, join and call to worship, we all turn it in your bulletin. I would like to take a moment to recognize our veterans and their families. If you have served in any of the branches of the armed services, if you would please stand. If you're in the choir, raise your hand. And then if your family member, if one of your immediate family members serves in the armed forces, if you can please stand. You can see that veterans have made a big impact on our community here at Amherst Park and continue to do so and we celebrate your selfless, selfless sacrifice. We know that family members, they watch the sacrifices along with the people who are and we go on our behalf. Now, if everyone will stand, let's join in our call to worship. People of God, take heart and lift your voices to the Lord. And our God is working to create new heavens and new earth. The trials of this life will not last forever. We rejoice in the hope of the coming day. On that day, there will no longer be weeping or illness. On that day, all people will dwell in safety. On that day, all creation will live in harmony. We rejoice in the hope of the coming day God has promised. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we do rejoice in the hope. We know that hope the seen is not hope at all, but we hold on to that which is unseen, that we trust will come in your time. On this Veterans Day weekend, we give you thanks and praise for all of the lives of those who answer the call to serve their nation. We praise you for family members who gave of their own lives as they supported those who were deployed to serve. Lord, we lift up the hearts minds who are injured, all of the pain that comes from war and the first of war. We hope in the day where there will no longer be a need for national defense, because as you promised, all people will dwell in safety and all creation will live in harmony. Help us to be supportive to one another. Help us to love and during this time of worship, above all, may we glorify you in all we say and all we do. It is in Christ Jesus' name we pray, the one who showed us what true selflessness is on the cross. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, please join me in the unity of prayer and the confession of the sound trinity of the Lord Jesus. In the silent time that follows, confess your sins privately before the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, remind us that we are loved when we find ourselves unloved. Remind us that there is hope when all we see around us makes us despair. Remind us that you sent the Prince of Peace when war and violence fell around. Remind us that you are a merciful judge when injustice seems to prevail. Remind us that you give us all we need to do your work in the world. Remind us that you give us the grace so that we can be your people. We confess our doubts and trust in your love. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being perfected by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Friends, our hope is secure in the eternal promises of our God. In Jesus Christ, we have confessed our sins, and our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. And you can find that on page 85 in the New Testament, the back portion of your pew Bible. Listen to God's word for you. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, Do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then Jesus said to them, Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, over the past year, as we have journeyed through Luke's gospel, we have realized time and time again that Jesus refuses to get into any box that we or our society might design for him. In fact, if you're looking for a nice and normal day, you might not want to invite Jesus to come along. You see, there was that time when his parents took him to the synagogue, and instead of being like a normal 12-year-old that can't wait to get out of church, right? Jesus stayed for days, and his parents almost lost their mind as they were searching for him for days on end. Then at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, when he went back to his hometown, that hometown crew almost threw him off a cliff because he told them there would be no preferential treatment 
in God's kingdom. And then there was the time where Jesus went to dinner and he made it awkward because he refused to follow the social norms. He called out others' behavior and he did that social faux pas of talking about religion at the table. The people Jesus associated with were the undesirables in society. His teachings went against the systems of power and prestige and wealth that ruled the day. And then, then we have today's passage. Everyone is sitting in the temple courts. It's Holy Week. They've entered just a few days earlier. They're admiring the beautiful stonework and the jewels and everything's just going great. But then Jesus says, no, this whole place is going to fall. Not one stone will be left upon another. So Jesus is probably not the tour guide that you want to lead your Holy Week excursion. You can imagine that was a bit of a downer. And in today's dialogue between Jesus and the disciples, Jesus foretells the coming disaster, destruction, and persecution that the disciples are going to face. His predictions, if you look at them, they pretty much encompass any anxiety that we might have about the future. There's the collapse of institutions with the fall of the temple, warring nature, nations, natural disasters, social upheaval, persecution, and even the loss of one's family and friends. So it's easy for us when we read these words from Jesus, when we read them to focus on the terrifying and terrible conditions that Jesus says are going to happen. However, if you look closely with me to Jesus's words, you'll see that his instructions and his promises found in these verses tell us that that is not the point. That's not why he makes these apocalyptic predictions. They are designed to shock us and to get our attention and make sure we're listening. But when we study these types of passages in scripture, we see that we are supposed to look past the terrible circumstances and hear Jesus's message that he has for his followers. Now, Jesus's message for the disciples who were right there with him that day and every disciple who has ever tried to follow Jesus is this. Don't allow the terrible circumstances that you see or that you imagine could happen to terrify your hearts and minds. Instead, hold fast to the promises of our faith because it's in our perseverance in holding on to faith over fear that we gain our souls. Now, passages like today's reading can also be difficult for us because we don't really know what to do, right? It's been 2,000 years after all. There's a whole lot of time that has passed that Jesus has not come back. So we don't know what to do. On the one hand, if we identify too closely with the disciples who were gathered that day, we might start to imagine that we are facing the same circumstances, regardless of whether we are or not. On the other hand, we certainly don't want to take these predictions lightly. Just because Jesus hasn't come back yet does not mean that he will not come back in our lifetime. And so when we take time to sift through and recognize what the specific circumstances were for those disciples, we're able to hone in and see the universal message for all disciples. Now, if you look at it, the passage isn't simply a prediction about end times. Jesus's prediction of the fall of the temple actually happened in the lifetime of those people sitting with him that day. In 70 AD, Rome invaded Jerusalem and laid waste to the temple that had just been finished a few years before. And it was a few years after that that Luke wrote this gospel. And so the recipients who received this gospel, they were actually, they had either heard about or witnessed the fall of the temple, 
And they were personally experiencing that persecution and the social ostracization that Jesus foretold. And so Jesus's words for the disciples that day and the recipients of Luke's gospel, that's what helped them to endure. When they read that Jesus knew that this was going to happen and that they should still hold on to their faith, that gave them strength. In the same way, throughout all the generations, these words help us to endure. Because we are also, even if they're not the same circumstances, we are going to face fears. Fears of the unknown, fears of destruction and disaster, fears of our own limitations, and fears of our personal loss that we might face. And so that is the message that we can hold on to today. Now, if you turn back to the beginning, I think it's interesting that the disciples don't say, no way, Jesus, right? I mean, if somebody came and said, oh, this whole place is going to be turned down and it's this huge, massive, you might doubt, but the disciples don't do that. Instead, they've gotten to that level of faith, but what they want is a timeline and a sign, right? And we can kind of sympathize with that. How many of us like to be taken off guard? It's like our favorite thing. Only Logan, right? We don't like to be taken off guard. That's not a good feeling. But Jesus doesn't answer their question. He doesn't tell them when or give them the sign. Instead, he warns them against anyone who would claim that they knew the timeline. Now in Matthew's gospel, if you flip over there, Jesus makes the point even clearer. He says, hey guys, I don't even know when I'm coming back. Who are we to think we should know more than Jesus, right? And so the point is not to know the time. Now as modern disciples, when we look to the news and we see wars and rumors of wars, it's easy to start to wonder if now might be the time. But Jesus says, that's not your job. Let God take care of God's business. You focus on following me. Now, the other half of Jesus's warning also holds true for us. He cautions us that we need to be aware of anyone that comes claiming to be our savior. While we may not be tricked if someone walked in the door and said, I'm Jesus, return, we're, we're pretty savvy. We might not fall for that. We can still fall for false messiahs. We fall when any institution or any individual promises us salvation, salvation that only Jesus can bring. There are so many false messiahs in our world. Financial security, the money and the power that we talked about during children's time. Modern technology, it's going to save us. College degrees, political alliances, careers, countries, or any individual that claims that they're that person who has it all figured out and can save us from having to face the woes of the world. It can even happen in the church when we elevate our leaders and put them on a pedestal, expecting them to save us instead of pointing us to Jesus as the one who saves us. And so Jesus says, in try, instead of trying to escape the unknowns of our lives, lean into them. Lean into those times where you don't know the timing or how it's going to work, because that's an opportunity to grow in faith as we trust that God does know and we can trust in God's guidance. So after telling the disciples about that coming destruction that was coming for the temple, Jesus goes on and makes that famous wars and rumors of wars prediction, along with the forecasted natural disasters that would characterize the world that the disciples needed to endure. Now, I think this is an appropriate week to talk about that. We just honored our veterans, right? Wars and rumors of wars have been the way of our world for all time. And then on Friday, even though it was sunny outside, the remnants of Hurricane Nicole, that natural disaster 
kept my children home on my day off. <laughs> it was tough. So whether they are from fellow humans or mother nature, the truth is that the threat of disaster is real. But Jesus doesn't say, go worry about that threat. Go obsess about it and try to make sure you'll be safe. No, look at verse 9. After saying all of those terrible things, Jesus says, do not be terrified. Do not allow the terrible circumstances to overwhelm you. Know that they are just going to be a reality of our lifetime. And do not be afraid. The next fear that Jesus addresses is twofold. First, there is that fear of persecution and social isol isolation. And second, the fear of inadequacy. Now, this is where we need to acknowledge the distance between us and those disciples. Last month, y'all might remember that Tom Brady caught some serious heat when he compared traveling as a professional football player and having to leave his children at home with being an active duty member of the military who's deployed to foreign lands. You can imagine how well that went over for him. Needless to say, it didn't sit well. In the same way, we need to acknowledge that the persecution and the social isolation that the early Christians faced was light years beyond what we might experience in our own lifetime. Our faith might cause us to be put in some very uncomfortable circumstances. We might even lose relationships. However, most of us are not going to be ostracized from the communities that we love. Most of us are not going to be brought before the authorities and die for our faith. However, Jesus' words for those disciples are still his words for us today. When we do go through hard times and have to face our fears, we have an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to witness to God's power working in our lives. While we do not embrace senseless suffering, we believe the truth that Paul proclaimed in Romans 5 when he said, affliction, suffering, produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And so when we face that unknown future and we fear our own inadequacy to stand in whatever that moment is that we imagine that we're pretty sure we're not going to know what to say or do, we can trust that the Holy Spirit has been poured into our hearts. It will, he will, they will, however, whatever pronoun you want, the Holy Spirit will guide us and give us the wisdom that we need so that we can navigate and speak on whatever that imagined day might be. We should not let our anxiety of our own ability to face tomorrow consume our hearts and our minds today. Now, a friend of mine, Harry Hill, is a retired minister, um, and I worked with him years ago, and he once served this country church, and there was a member there who read this passage and thought, well, that means, preacher, that you shouldn't write your sermons. You should get up in the pulpit and just speak from your heart. And so one Sunday, Harry got up in the pulpit and his manuscript was gone. He looked back to the back seat and there that man was holding it up <laughs> and smiling. Well, Harry, um, before his hair went white, he was a redhead, and he did not mince words. He marched his behind on down. He said, excuse me, someone has stolen my sermon. And he went right to that man and retrieved it and came back up and went on preaching. So we don't believe, the moral of the story is, we don't believe that when Jesus promises to give us the words, that means we never should prepare for a known circumstance. This is an unknown circumstance that we should not have to worry about. 
In fact, we should be studying God's word today so that it's in our heart and the Holy Spirit can bring it to mind when we need it. But we don't need to worry. We don't need to worry about our own limitations or inabilities. God has called us to be the church and to witness to Jesus Christ here and now. And God is going to give us whoever we are, whatever we can do to shine that light and spread God's love. Now, whether or not we are the firsthand witnesses of the second coming of Jesus Christ, we can be sure that we are all called to witness to Jesus Christ and the way he comes to us every day in this life of faith. We are called to tell the story of how even in those terrible times, our faith kept fear from taking control. I'll be honest. I still hope that I don't endure what those first Christians did. Persecution is not really on my spiritual to-do list. However, I hear Jesus' message for us today. The message is this. Don't think that we have to have it all figured out to have faith. In fact, be wary of anyone who claims that they do. Don't allow the fear of what we hear or what we see or what we imagine can happen to take control of our hearts and our minds. Even if we lose the things and the people that we hold closest to our hearts, we can never lose our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. In fact, it's in our endurance and perseverance as we trust that Jesus is the Messiah and our daily commitment to choose faith over fear that we will gain our souls. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our only comfort in life and death is that we belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to ourselves, but to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all our sins and has completely freed us from the dominion of the devil, so that he protects us so well that without the will of our Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from our head. Indeed, that everything must fit his earth for our salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures us of eternal life and makes us wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live it for him. And let's turn to the and gracious God, while we hold on to the promises of our faith that Jesus has given us that he will never leave us or forsake us, it is easy to allow fears to rise, to rise and take over our hearts and minds. Lord, we pray that you will help us to persevere and endure as we hold on to the hope in you. When we hear wars and rumors of war, may our hearts be still, trusting that you are God, that you are working all things towards your good end and your good time. Lord, we lift up this Veterans Day weekend, all of those who have served the country. We lift up all who answer the call of selflessness and their faith. We pray especially for those whose experience has been limited. We ask that you help us in our ministry to continue to be physical reminders of your love, the love that does not give up or disappoint. Lord, we ask that your peace will reign in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, and Lord, in your ways. That we will look to one another brothers and sisters and friends. Holy God, help us to trust you. Help us to embody Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to the time of worship where you are invited to participate as you respond to God's goodness and God's grace. We thank everyone who has pledged for this coming year so far. We are very encouraged about all that God has planned for us together as a community of faith. If you're not yet pledged, we would appreciate um, session will be meeting next week, so that would be very helpful as we continue to make this year. Friends, give generously as God has given to you.